It's time for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for three years has shared with us her decades research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative and judicial processes in America. And now, here's May. Good afternoon. This is Dialogue Conspiracy number 172, November 24, 1974. The anniversary of the assassination of John Kennedy is just over the 11th anniversary. Uh, this week was a busy week doing radio programs around the country that I did from the House. The important thing is that there were several stations, one in Cleveland, WERE, and one in Dallas, Texas, a CBS station that did three continuous days of research ev evidence of conspiracy that the researchers had uncovered. They ran sort of a marathon of conspiracy, which I think was very interesting. And they had various people on the programs um, I was on, and there was Penn Jones from Texas and Fletcher Prouty, who used to be at the CIA, and Jim Garrison from New Orleans, and uh, Harold Weisberg and Sherman Skolnick from Chicago. And they used the various researchers from around the country uh, giving their opinions and findings 11 years after the political assassinations. Um, the stations mentioned that they're not only going to do this in November, one week a year, but they're going to continue doing it. And the radio stations are picking up uh, the researchers. I know by the amount of calls I get and the letters, they are picking up information of this conspiracy that killed John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or Martin Luther King uh, frequently. They don't wait till the anniversary of the deaths. And the announcers are serious in pursuing this subject and encouraging the researchers for the first time. And these, I'm talking about, are AM stations, not FM stations, around the country. So one morning it's Milwaukee, and one evening it was KFI in Los Angeles. And you spot and begin to mark the map, and you realize that a certain amount of people are getting educated to some story other than the official version that Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy or Officer Tippett in Dallas, Texas. Uh, there was an article in uh, the paper this morning. There were two articles that pertain to the political assassinations. One was regarding a new book coming out by Harold Weisberg. He's an excellent researcher. He has a book called Whitewash 4 coming out. Uh, Whitewash 1, 2, and 3 are available by Weisberg. Uh, you can write to him at Frederick, Route 8 in Maryland. Vox, it's zip code 21701. Weisberg wrote a book called Frame Up, The Death of Martin Luther King. He now has a new book out. It's called Whitewash 4. And he has documents from the National Archives which show that Alan Dulles told the Warren Commission that the FBI and the CIA directors could lie to anyone, any person, to conceal identities of their undercover agents with the exception of the president. Now, Alan Dulles uh, was the former head of the CIA who was removed by John Kennedy. He is co-author at the time of the Kennedy assassination, maybe before, maybe afterwards, but at least during that period, was E. Howard Hunt. Alan Dulles became a member of the Warren Commission after Kennedy was killed. And according to the minutes of the Warren Commission meetings, which I have, Dulles collected all the information about Lee and Marina Oswald that came into the Warren Commission to help write the profile of Lee Harvey Oswald. And the information that he collected was the witness testimony of the people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area or New Orleans. And Lee Harvey Oswald was an intelligence agent working for the CIA. Alan Dulles used CIA witnesses to testify against Oswald. That is what I based my eight years research on was the use of people from the spy agencies to create the, pro the profile of Oswald, the fictitious profile. So you see, if people were from the CIA or FBI, the, uh, the document shows now and is available out of the National Archives that these agents could lie. They could lie to any person, including members of the Warren Commission, except the President of the United States. The memo that Alan Dulles wrote is dated January 27, 1964. That was about three weeks after the first meeting of the Warren Commission. And in regard whether J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, and John McCone, director of the CIA, would answer, tru answer truthfully if they were questioned whether Oswald was working 
for either of their agencies. And Alan Dulles said, in quotes, I would, under any circumstances, I think Mr. Hoover would certainly say he didn't have anything to do with this fellow. Now, this is a new document coming out because Oswald was an employee of the FBI from the time he returned in the Soviet Union from about June 1962 when he returned home. Alan Dulles continued, this is a new declassified memo, in quotes, I would still, I would tell the President of the United States anything. Yes, but I'm under his control. I wouldn't necessarily tell anybody else anything unless the President authorized me to do it, end quotes. That's interesting because Lyndon Johnson, three months before he died, wrote, it was published in documents, and said that Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill President John Kennedy, that a team from the Caribbean, he referred to them as Murder Incorporated, killed John Kennedy. But Lyndon Johnson uh, evidently was told the truth about who killed Kennedy, but nobody else below him was allowed to tell. There also is in this memo a quotation of Senator Russell's where, uh, or it's in Weisberg's book, and he asked J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, if Oswald never assassinated the president and had been in the employee of the FBI and somebody had gone to the FBI, would they have denied he was an agent? At the time of the Warren Commission meetings, Hoover denied it, and Alan Dulles answered exactly. He would deny that he was a member of the FBI. And then John J. McCoon was asked by the Warren Commission if Oswald had any connection with the CIA because McCoon at the time was the acting director of the CIA. And McCoon said, I have determined to my satisfaction he had no such connection, end quotes. Now that's to his satisfaction, that isn't to ours, but this goes along with a document I've read on KLRB before, Dialogue Conspiracy. It has to do with the Warren Report Chapter 6, page 307, and various footnotes. It, it's the one document I have of lawyers from the Warren Commission, Slauson, writing to Willens, and it had to do with Oswald in Mexico City. And remember the climate of Mexico City. Oswald was in there September and October, and if you read the White House tapes this last week, William Buckley of the CIA was working with E. Howard Hunt in the CIA in Mexico at this time. And the Warren Commission archives have a document, which I have a copy of, which says in quotes about the exhibits and guests at the hotel. This is where Lee Harvey Oswald stayed. I have inserted phantom commission numbers. I have fudged the text sufficiently so that almost anything can be fitted in, end quotes. Well, that's the way the FBI was working in the CIA. I've read that quotation on the program before. But I did want to say in conjunction today that Alan Dulles did defend lying to protect the FBI and the CIA because Oswald was an agent of the intelligence, of Navy intelligence. There is a document in the new book by Harold Weisberg telling um, the Warren Commission protect the FBI and the CIA and lying is okay. Another man important to the uh, Warren Commission and his major assassinations is William Sullivan of the FBI. He has a lead story in the news today from the Washington Post. It says, ex-agent charges the FBI threatens our liberty. He's talking about our liberty today, right now, and it's about William Sullivan of Division 5 of the FBI, head of internal security. He left the FBI in 71, and he was the third highest agent under J. Edgar Hoover. And he has charged that the FBI has the potential power to threaten our civil liberties and that the power should be reduced and that there should be a three-year moratorium on electronic eavesdropping by any federal agency. Now, he isn't talking about the evidence they plant against people or the witnesses that perjure themselves. He's talking about the electronic computerized information which Mr. Kelly is an expert of and which he was brought in to synchronize every living person in the United States. I'm sure would go into that data bank. He's trying to get more power to link this up through the 50 states, and Mr. Sullivan has surfaced and asked for a moratorium. The FBI gets a budget of $366 million a year, and Sullivan said we have to separate the FBI from politics and politics from the FBI. He complained that the 30 years that he worked there that they were sealed off from the outside world and the experiences and thinking of others from the very beginning, that the bureaucracy started in '39. Uh, one of the things William Sullivan has said is that the weakness of the FBI has been the leadership in Washington, of which I was a part for 15 years, and I accept my part of the blame for its shortcomings. 
Now, the leadership he's talking about in Washington is identical to Eichmann saying, I was following orders, or any good German saying that they were following Hitler. In the second article I did for The Realist that came out in July 73, I listed William Sullivan of Division 5 as being one of the most important witnesses that should have been called at the Watergate at the time of the hearings because he is linked. He was the connecting link, and at the time of the Watergate he was, too, of the FBI to the Central Intelligence Agency to the Defense Intelligence Agency. And I have documents alleging that William Sullivan was very much a part and designer of the assassination of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin, Martin Luther King, which were politics and not supposed to be part of the FBI. He's saying now, as a swan song, let's take politics out of the FBI, but these men were killed for political reasons. At the time of the Watergate, Sullivan was working with John Ehrlichman, the domestic staff. They were preparing a coup for 72, similar to what we had in Dallas in 63. If the Democrats had a good ticket of Muskie and Ted Kennedy, for example, we wouldn't have had elections if the real Watergate story, what they're covering up, the cover-up of the cover-up was the planned coup. And William Sullivan was very important in that. And now he's crying, he's ill, and he's in New Hampshire. And he's um, asking to curtail the FBI, but he's not coming clean. He's, he's coming out as a flaming liberal now who's protecting our civil liberties, and there should be a massive investigation of uh, Mr. Ruth, the Justice Department, if it were possible, into what William Sullivan was doing. He was taking papers from the desk of uh, J. Edgar Hoover at the time of the water game, giving to them to Ehrlichman. And they were documents that would defeat Richard Nixon down the board if they were ever exposed. And they wanted to make sure that Nixon was elected president, so he stole them from J. Edgar Hoover, who I believe was murdered shortly afterwards in 72. Hoover was murdered in May, and he was being pilfered. The excuse was that he was senile, but there was no indication that J. Edgar Hoover was senile. He had too much information on the team, and maybe in his senility or in a sleeping pill he would talk. So he was done in, but William Sullivan, is singing this sad liberal song, and he should be made to account, like Richard Helms is coming home to account for certain things that went on. Admiral Moore is being brought to task. Uh, General Haig is being asked about the bugging, the wiretapping. There's a power play going on continuously back there, and they're vying for protection. And I take this article, our civil liberties are in danger, but William Sullivan is the person to know, but he's not telling the truth about the allegations against him that have been made very frequently. I've been making them for quite a few years since I got information about his role in the Defense Intelligence Agency and in the White House. But he should be investigated and be brought to tell more than what he's doing. Well, this last week there was a uh, program on a ABC broadcast uh, called A Time to Remember in Memory of John Kennedy. And I wanted to talk about that today to correlate what is brainwashing in the mass media as compared to, say, some of the things we can share on Dialogue Conspiracy, and you can look up for yourself to show every year, year after year, how the people are being brainwashed with the same story that Oswald did it alone. The, there was the use of subliminal suggestion, the spot introduction of the idea that loner madman killed Oswald. The format of the show was impersonal. There were people on the beach, uh, in the living rooms, on a boat. They interviewed Rose Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, and Mr. Porter, who's doing the Kennedy Museum, Pierre Salinger, and so forth. And two-thirds through the show, a radio announcer came on. I don't know his name, if he was the producer of the show or just an announcer, and he sat with two individuals. One was Jim Bishop, who wrote the book The Day Kennedy Was Shot, and the other was David Belline, who wrote the book November 22, 1963. Belline was a lawyer for the Warren Commission, Bishop allegedly a friend of John Kennedy, allegedly. The announcer, uh, in the middle of these scenes with the ocean and the boating and so forth, sat in a chair and very clearly said, now you know there was no conspiracy to kill John Kennedy. One lone manman did it, one crazy man. Three bullets killed him. There was no conspiracy. Now there was no dialogue about that. I have 109 books with references or indication that there was a conspiracy, but this wasn't the program that was to bring it up. He made it clear there was no conspiracy. Jim Bishop then on the program, who, as I say, wrote the one book, The Day Kennedy Was Shot, went on to give a little anecdote to confirm that there was no conspiracy. And he told 
how um, it was a fluke of history that Kennedy would be alive except for a Mr. Rowland if he had gone to the sheriff's department the morning that John Kennedy was killed and told them that he saw a man on the sixth floor window, Lee Harvey Oswald, with a weapon outside the window just before the assassination, the Secret Service might have stopped the motorcade. That was Mr. Bishop's little anecdote that Mr. Rowland saw somebody at the sixth floor window. David Bellin then added to it and said, well, the history was with us again. There was another fluke. He said Oswald didn't decide to murder Kennedy until November 21st when somebody at the Texas School Book Depository dropped a newspaper and the newspaper uh, stated where the motorcade was going to come and then his eyes went up to the ceiling, Balin's, and, and he, as if to say Oswald got an inspiration, went home and got his gun and decided he'd kill Kennedy. And then Balin of the Warren Commission had one more statement. He said, if Oswald had waited one more day uh, and gotten a job at, from the employment agency instead of the book depository, history would have served another direction. If he hadn't gone to the depository, he would have had another job and we would have been spared the assassination. Now those three facts, that's all they said. Then they went back to reminiscing with Pierce Allinger and other people and back to uh, Ethel Kennedy, or Rose Kennedy rather, not Ethel, and taking in uh, the program. They went back to the format of remembering. But those two fools uh, sat there, those three fools, with a straight face and passed three lies about Mr. Rowland, the story about Mr. Rowland, the story about Oswald's job, and the story about his finding the motorcade and deciding. So I got out my research. One thing I know is that Mr. David Bellon and every member of the Warren Commission was selected by such a top secret uh, system that that's locked up in the National Archives for 75 years. All the lawyers and secretaries are members of the Central Intelligence Agency. And if you remember the memo this morning, Dulles told the CIA and the FBI they could lie, and the investigators were all of the CIA. Now, Jim Bishop wrote a book called The Day Kennedy Was Shot. It was a 685-page book. I looked up his book in the episode of Witnesses. He's got a thing on Witnesses. Jim Bishop has no mention of Mr. Rowland, who allegedly saw Oswald on the sixth floor window. In his own book, and he's talking about Mr. Rowland, he doesn't even mention it in his own book. Now, David Bellin did the investigation of uh, the witnesses. He did the motorcade investigation for the Warren Commission, and I looked up his book. And his book is uh, another 600-page book, and he's got a whole chapter on the killing and the witnesses. And would you believe that he doesn't mention Mr. Rowland either in his book? Uh, chapter 21, page 161 to 177, on witnesses to the assassination, and he doesn't mention Mr. Rowland. They take a national TV show at prime time and tell you about this man who saw all this, and yet they each wrote a book and don't even find time to mention it in their own books. So I looked up the Warren Commission records of 552 witnesses called before the Warren Commission. And Mr. Rowland was never called as a witness before the Warren Commission. Uh, there were other witnesses. There was one witness who was the next door neighbor of a deceased babysitter who took care of Lee Harvey Oswald when he was 18 months old. Now she was important. She lived in New Orleans and he sat in a high chair and threw a little gun, a toy gun on the floor. But they couldn't find Mr. Rowland that they were going to talk about 11 years later. They could use a third-party neighbor of a deceased babysitter, but they couldn't find Mr. Rowland. So I got my Warren Commission index, there's one section of volume 15, to look up the testimony where Mr. Rowland's name was mentioned. And it's in volume 7 of the hearings before the President's Commission on the assassination of President Kennedy. And I looked up the testimony of a Mr. Sorrells, who was the sheriff in Dallas, Texas, to see in what context this great witness was that Bellon didn't write about and a Bishop didn't write about and the commission didn't want him as a witness. So I went, well, who is Mr. Rowland? I had read it a few years earlier. So I looked up the testimony. For those of you who are researchers, it's page 332 of Volume 7 of the Warren Commission hearings. And it's the testimony of Mr. Sorrells, who's a sheriff in Dallas, Texas, and he tells about his background in the Secret Service and the decision of the motorcade and the protective research. And he talks about uh, the route that they took turning the corner and that his job, his job was to look in the window and see if any witnesses were around. And he didn't see anyone coming from the witnesses at any window. As a member of the Secret Service, he'd been there for many years since Roosevelt days. 
and he's riding in a car looking all around and his responsibility with the buildings and the windows he's asked that and he says yes and he didn't see anybody so then after the car passes the book depository and Kennedy is killed they speed to Parkland Hospital and then Sorrells of the Secret Service returns back to the book depository and he goes there and the door is open and he's looking for witnesses who might know something about the assassination. And he gets there 20 minutes after the assassination. He said, I go to the back of the building and there's a man standing at the rear platform loading and he's just standing there looking at a distance and I don't think he knew what happened. Now this is 20 minutes after the assassination. The Dallas Police Secret Service and FBI are all around. He says, did you get his name? No, I did not. I didn't stop to do that. What was he doing? The man was standing on the loading platform. Uh, how long was he there? I don't know. Was there any policeman there? No, I didn't see anyone. No, sir. Did you enter the building without identifying yourself? Yes, sir. This is Mr. Stern interviewing Mr. Sorrells. Stern is a Warren Commission. Sorrells is Secret Service. Then I walked to the front door and said, did anyone here see anything? And he talked to Mr. Brennan, who was across the street, who gave some information. He's at the def deputy sheriff's office, and they say, wait a minute, maybe there's someone you ought to talk to. And so he went, he saw one witness, but he didn't take his name, and he couldn't recall where he was afterwards because he didn't take his name down. He said, there's a man here. So Sorrells, uh, he asked him his name. He said, I think it's Mr. and Mrs. Arnold. And the Warren Commission steers him clear. They said, are you sure? And he says, this, this is Secret Service in the Sheriff's Department. He says, yeah. Was that his first name? And Searle says, yeah, that was his first name. And then Stern said, can you recall his second name? He said, well, I'd know it if I heard it. And the Warren Commission says, was it Mr. Rowland? He says, yeah, Rowland, that's right. What did he tell you? He said that they were standing there waiting for the president, and they were talking about security. And he looked up at the window towards the west window, and a man was standing there with what appeared to be a telescopic sight. Now, this is page 351 of Volume 7, and he's confirming what's in their books later but the witness was never called as a witness and look how it reads this is what he says he sees a man the window the telescopic sky and he remarked to his wife and his wife said i guess that's a secret service man but she's nearsighted and left her glasses at home and she couldn't give a description uh well tell us about the men how could you tell the warren commission said how could you tell how could you determine that there was a sight on a sixth floor window. And remember, Oswald was behind all those boxes that was supposed to be a lair, remember? And he said, well, it seemed wider on the light background. Uh, how was he holding it? Well, he was standing several feet away from the window. Now, here's a man two feet away from a window that he was supposed to have seen. The Warren Commission said, did Mr. Rowland tell you he saw anyone else in the window in the depository? Searles, I don't recall he did. I don't recall that. He may have, but I don't recall it. They asked if he took any of this down. He didn't transcribe it. He didn't have the name. He thought it was a Mr. Arnold. Did he mention anyone on the sixth floor? I don't recall. He didn't mention anyone there. Um, well, the thing is that hit me first is why he's standing there. I should have gone to the sheriff's office and said, look, there's a man with a rifle. Uh, and I said to him, didn't you say anything about it? And he said, no, he didn't do it. Now, the Warren Commission said, did you look towards that window? He's asking the Secret Service uh, agent and member of the Sheriff's Department, did you look towards that window that Roland had pointed from the spot he was standing to see if it was possible to observe from there someone standing several back, feet back from the window? Did you have an occasion to check that? And he said, well, no, not specifically. Later on, I heard he said that he was standing 15 feet back and I thought to myself, I don't think you could see anything that far back. The Warren Commission says, but he didn't tell you that. No, he said he was standing back of the window looking around there and he saw this man. Then I went on to another witness and I don't recall the name. And that's the end of page 351 and it goes on to another subject. So a person, a third person who's supposed to be investigating the case goes to the depository looking for witnesses, sees one at the door, claims he doesn't know there was an assassination, walks in a building, 20 minutes later, he's been to Parkland Hospital and back. The police have left the door open. He comes up with a person who saw it with someone in the window. First, they were two feet back. Then they were 15 feet back. He didn't stand in the position the witness was at on the street to see if it was possible. Remember, there was a big tree there that blocked the vision from the book depository down. He didn't go where the boxes were to see. And yet, 11 years later, 
America Broadcasting System tells you that Oswald was seen by a man named Roland who wasn't it called as a witness to before the Warren Commission. He wasn't mentioned by Mr. Bishop in his book or David Bellon. There's no evidence at all that he saw someone at that window. There were photographs taken at the window at the time of the assassination that weren't used by the Warren Commission that are in the hands of researchers, and the window was empty. The window that Oswald allegedly was at was empty, and yet on ABC in November 22nd, 1974, we're getting the same garbage we got 11 years ago. Now, to get on to some more of their lies, uh, they said that Mrs. Payne, uh, they mentioned that Mrs. Payne happened to call the book depository and get a job for Lee Oswald, and that if he had gone a day later, uh, he would have had another job. The truth is that they didn't tell you Mrs. Payne, Ruth Payne, is from military intelligence. Her husband is from military intelligence. Uh, he worked at Bell Aerospace in Fort Worth. She called Roy Truly and said, I have a friend whose husband needs a job, Marina Oswald's husband, that was on October the 15th, and Oswald was hired on October 16th at the Texas School Book Depository. Ruth Payne of military intelligence got the job. Now, Oswald uh, was also employed, according to volume 11 of the Warren Commission hearings, page 398, he went for a job October 15, 1963, at Trans Texas Cargo Handler. And we've talked about this on another show, I believe, but I'm bringing it up because it came up again on ABC this week, their lies. Oswald was went for an interview, a Lee Harvey Oswald, at Love Airfield on October the 15th, the same day he went to the book depository, and allegedly was hired October the 16th at the book depository and also as a cargo carrier at $310 a month. Volume 22, page 763, there's an FBI report saying they should check with Marina Oswald on the job that Lee got at the Trans-Texas Company, and she couldn't recall a job where she as one small child, a little over two years old, she's pregnant with another. He can get $100 more for the Trans-Texas Company, and she can't recall, although the employment record shows clearly he had a job at two places. And, of course, it's logical to have him at the airport because if somebody saw that the motorcade was dangerous, and it was with slowing a detour, going under past tall buildings, uh, it was a perfect place for snipers, then if the motorcade was changed at the last minute, there would be a Lee Harvey Oswald at Love Airfield that would do the assassination. Now, it wasn't a question of taking uh, this job one day after. The history, the documents, exhibits show that he got them the same day. It wasn't that he got a job at the depository on one day and the Love Field came in on the next day. The documents prove that they both came on the 15th of October and were accepted on the 16th of October. And again, I have read on the radio a Warren Commission letter dated March the 12th from the National Archives where a member of the Warren Commission wrote to Mr. Jenner and Liebler saying that inasmuch as Oswald took a job at the depository for $100 less than he did at Love Airfield, there had to be a non-economic uh, reason for wanting to be at the Texas School Depository Building. I read this on a radio uh, program at KFI in Los Angeles, and the announcer said, well, that proves that he was getting set up for the conspiracy because he wanted it in October, and it was $100 less. And I pointed out that the Warren Commission, David Bellin, was telling us on ABC that he didn't know until November 21st that he had the job. That's the point in October. He was covered at both places, and he didn't find out, according to what they said on the television show this week, it wasn't true that he knew just one night before. You see, he had the two jobs, and he was covered, and they were lying about that. It was a non-economic reason for being at the book depository. And also the fact they mentioned that he didn't know the motorcade until the day before. And I have said on the program before, a letter of the Warren Commission's dated April the 7th, 1964, that the Sam Bloom Agency, the public relations and advertising agency, handled the motorcade of President Kennedy when he was in Dallas, Texas, and that Jagger's Chili Stovall, the photographic lab, had sent people over in conjunction with work. They did work for uh, Saul Bloom Agency, and that Lee Harvey Oswald had been at this agency 60 different days within a 10-week period. Lee Harvey Oswald had been 
at the Sam Bloom agency that carried the motorcade. Now, one uh, piece of information which I have not carried on Dialogue Conspiracy uh, to back up this kind of uh, research is an article from Penn Jones' paper, February the 10th, 1972, and it has to do with the Sam Bloom Agency, the CIA, and uh, the, not only carrying the motorcade, but carrying the trial of Jack Ruby. The article that Penn Jones had, it's on the Women's Liberation Movement, and it said MS publisher Elizabeth Forsling Harris uh, may be infiltrating the women's liberation movement. She's become the editor of MS Magazine. According to a Dallas paper, Mrs. Harris accompanied liberation leader Gloria Steinem during Steinem's appearance in Dallas. This was in 72, and it's since been publicly proclaimed by Gloria Steinem that she had worked for the CIA. Penn Jones was saying in 72 that uh, Mrs. Harris and Gloria Steinem were the CIA. Penn said, since reading Coup d'etat by Lutwak, it is easier to understand the enormous planning and checking and double-checking necessary before the killing of President Kennedy could be successfully accomplished. Taking over the smallest, most powerful country in the world is not a small task. Having constant surveillance on the opinion makers in Dallas was only one of the necessary requisites in the planning stages. Betty Forsling Harris appears to have been one of the high-level observers that moved to, from Washington. She left Dallas shortly after the assassination. She came to Dallas a few years before the assassination. She worked for the Saul Bloom Advertising Agency and was referred by Washington planners as our Dallas contact. She attended the important planning sessions for the coming visit of the president. This is the Saul Bloom Agency that planned the visit of the president, and Lee Harvey Oswald had been to that agency 60 times. The Bloom Agency handled the public relations for the visit, and they also handled the public relations for the Jack Ruby trial. It was a first for any court to have a public relations firm handle a court case. Elizabeth Forsling Harris was a very close co-worker with Jack Pewterbaugh on the Dallas trip, which cost the life of President Kennedy. Pewterbaugh came to Washington from Minnesota. It was Pewterbaugh who made the decision to hold the luncheon at the trademark because of its proximity to Love Field. And it was Pewter Bow who made the decision to take the unauthorized and unnecessary detour in Dealey Plaza. The two decisions make Pewter Bow up to his hips in the assassination. He and Betty Harris were never questioned by the Warren Commission. Now, this same Pewter Bow that I mentioned, Jack Pewter Bow, that made the decision for the detour is mentioned by the same sheriff who brought in the role, and he worked with them in deciding the motorcade. He worked with Peter Bow, and and he produced the witness Roland that the establishment, the apologists for the Warren Commission are using 11 years later. But Lee Harvey Oswald had been in that office 60 times. That office was working with Washington, D.C. It was that office and those people that decided on the choice of the trademark for lunch, but more important, they made the unauthorized decision of the detour in Dealey Plaza. Mr. Lawton of the Secret Service, who was in charge of the protection of John Kennedy, was called as a witness before the Warren Commission and said that the decision to uh, which way the motorcade made was made when not in his presence. It was made in a private club in Dallas, Texas. And I knew, you know, as the history unfolded when I read that testimony a few, oh, many years ago, it seems like now, that when you break these people down who attended the luncheon and then connect them to placing Lee Harvey Oswald in the building and then later, 11 years later, you connect them to still forging that cover story. Uh, it all fits together every day that we do this research. It all fits together tighter. But I think it was important that uh, in their paranoia, their, their, not paranoia, but in their interest of brainwashing us over and over again, we had to get the story on the television instead of just remembering John Kennedy for what he contributed or offered or as people remembered him. It wasn't a subject on conspiracy. It was just what people remembered about John Kennedy. They had to throw in the garbage that had no basis, in fact, in which they couldn't substantiate in their own books, and they're supposed to be the experts, and the Warren Commission didn't even call these people as witnesses. I have uh, many, many witnesses, maybe um, about 180, that I want to do a book someday called Witnesses Not Called. And these are the kind of people that I want to write about and show what questions they should have been asked and weren't asked and why the Warren Commission came up with the wrong conclusion 
that Lee Harvey Oswald shot John Kennedy. Last week, uh, in conjunction with that, I talked about a school booklet, social studies uh, information booklet that was passed out in Carmel, California to the social studies class, science class at the school my daughter attends, the one about Oswald looking out the window and killing Kennedy, and it says he didn't do him any harm. He didn't mean it. Kennedy didn't do Oswald any harm, and he shot him and gave a little smile and killed him. And the book is dated, um, it was 1966, from Noble and Noble Publishers in New York City. And I wrote to these people uh, and told them that I had done a lot of work on the John Kennedy assassination and that the copyright of this was 1966 and that there had been a lot of work about the conspiracy since. And I think it's time that they pulled this book back and let investigators into the assassination write a booklet for the next year if they're going to do this thing or if it gets into the textbooks uh, and really start to educate the children and not give them lies. They wonder why there's so many dropouts and the kids through osmosis or radio programs or news can pick up some of what they're getting as being lies and not meaningful. And I wrote to this publisher and I got a letter uh, today. Dear Ms. Bressel, thank you for reminding us that our Springboard's pamphlet on John Kennedy needs updating. As soon as the economic climate permits us to consider revising this valuable program, we will certainly consider your offer to write a version that reflects more recent findings. Uh, very truly yours, Warren Cox, Editor-in-Chief. And then he wanted to know about the publication, The Realist, how often it comes out, and I'll send him some copies. Well, I think uh, I can interpret this two ways. They may never get an economic climate that permits writing a new one so they can get the old history for the next hundred years, or they could stop sending this out entirely. They're being paid to publish the old one. Maybe they should give no version if it isn't that accurate. But I'll follow it up and write to them, and I'm going to write to the school system here. And if any of you want to write to, it's called Noble and Noble Publishers, 1 Dog Hammarskjöld Plaza. 245 East 47th Street, New York, Noble and Noble Publishers, Incorporated, Dog Hammarskjöld Plaza, 245 East 47th Street, Warren Cox, Editor-in-Chief. I know there's a lot of people listening to this program and get tapes who are serious researchers who resent uh, the history being perverted around, and you may support my letter by writing to them or back up my allegations and tell them that, uh, how many schools do receive this document, what is their budget to send this out. I don't have the time or energy to give this the full push I should, so I'm throwing this out in the air in hopes that some of you follow it through if you're so inclined, and I hope you do. Uh, just before the program was over last week, um, I was talking about the articles in National Tatler magazine. There's been a four-part series that started, one was August the 4th, on a Joe Cooper private investigator who was working in New Orleans on the links of Navy intelligence to the John Kennedy assassination. And um, he was uncovering the getaway planes that David Ferry was to provide, but most important, a meeting on a boat outside of New Orleans uh, three months before the assassination that had to do with the assassination of John Kennedy. Um, August the 4th was the first revelation about this information. August the 18th in National Tatler magazine, there was more about the links of Navy intelligence to the John Kennedy assassination. And also mentioned that Joe Cooper felt that his life was in danger. He had been in an automobile accident and his family was almost killed. The last article before the one I received today was October the 16th, 1974, and Joe Cooper was found shot in the face lying in bed, dead, and he had sent off letters to, to uh, John Mulder of National Tatler that the, of the evidence he had collected of the conspiracy to kill John Kennedy, and uh, this is in the hands of lawyers and investigators right now. But a fourth article of that series came out today, and it's uh, the slain Tatler source on the verge of uh, breaking the assassination. It's a headline here. Investigator shooting still a mystery to police, but they ruled out the suicide. And it goes into uh, linking JFK assassination to the U.S. military intelligence system. Uh, those of you who are researchers who are interested in this subject, I would suggest that you subscribe to National Tatler. They have uh, 
wonderful issues, the, a centerfold that you can order on the John Kennedy assassination, one on the Robert Kennedy. But they're running this series now, and I'll read you a little bit today, of today's article because it's still on the stands and you can buy it. And then if you get this, you can go out and get the other back issues. I think they're very worthwhile. The article today says private investigator William Joe Cooter Cooper was murdered because he was very close to proving persons in the U.S. defense and intelligence communities conspired to kill President Kennedy. Uh, getting away from the tattler, remember that the program opened with Alan Dulles saying that you, they could lie about the CIA and the FBI, and this does link, Oswald was linked to the intelligence community. The tattler goes on saying that Cooper devoted 10 years of his life to trying to solve the Kennedy assassination mystery. He was shot to death in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, October the 16th, 1974. Uh, after one week of investigation, the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Department ruled the death a suicide. The chief investigator said openly it was a matter of convenience. We don't know what happened, and we had to rule something. Our only choice was accident, suicide, or homicide. He was, Cooper was found shot in the face in his bed at 7.30 a.m., now, the barrel of the gun, in order to commit suicide, he had to take the barrel of the gun, put it to his right cheek, pull the trigger, wipe off all fingerprints. The weapon had no fingerprints on it. Take the gun, put it in his left hand, put it under the bed, because Cooper was right-handed, put it under the bed, put the covers all over himself before he died. And um, his wife was in the apartment in another room. The door was open. The door had been locked that night. The door is open. They thought maybe somebody had been hiding in the closet when she left her room, had come out, shot, and then left. Cooper, 50 years old, had supplied Tatler with information that two men, one a pilot, were offered 25000 to fly two unidentified men from Dallas to South America on the day Kennedy was murdered. Cooper also uncovered evidence linking high-ranking U.S. Navy officials to the key assassination figures. Now, two of those would be John Conley and one would be Fred Korth, who was secretary of the Navy, who, who resigned shortly afterwards because of scandals or conflict of interest with general dynamics over the F-111. And Fred Korth's links with Marguerite Oswald are in these articles, and they're also in Marguerite Oswald's testimony before the Warren Commission, Volume 1, and her allegations about Fred Korth. The article says the day before Cooper was killed, a letter and a packet of information mailed by him arrived in the Tatler office, included was a report, copies of government documents, letters, and supporting evidence. Before this reporter had a chance to even discuss the information with Cooper, he was dead. The material is being analyzed for use in future articles. There was no motive for him committing suicide. He was in excellent spirits Monday and Tuesday before his death. He had been with his son-in-law. He was high, and he had mailed off this information, and he had said, Earlier, he was afraid of his life and that he did have one automobile accident. The article says Cooper was a policeman in Baton Rouge for 10 years, served on the police force in Florida cities. He was once named as the Outstanding Policeman of the Year. He had a knack for detail that led him on a decade-long investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy. He pursued the theory that Kennedy's assassination was planned aboard a naval aircraft carrier, the Shangri-La, during a pleasure cruise in August 63, three months before Kennedy was shot to death. Now, I don't think it was planned. The death was planned in 1960, but the final touches could have been on the cruise. He tried to seek information from the Navy Department about those people on the cruise, never got the identity of two men on board, and when he pursued the issue, the investigation was turned over to a Navy intelligence officer who wanted to know why Cooper was interested. Uh, Cooper was a World War II Navy hero who received a presidential citation for his contribution to this country. The National Tatler has a diagram of um, the bed, the way he was, the blanket, the gun under the bedding, the blanket was pulled over him. And there's an important thing in the article. He, d the lawyer described plans in 1960 to kill Kennedy before the Bay of Pigs inv invasion. And I've said that the murder was planned earlier than 1962, that the death wasn't to avenge the Bay of Pigs pulling back of John Kennedy, that he would have been murdered in either event, that he wasn't the president that the CIA and military intelligence wanted. Well, I don't have time to go over the four Tatler articles. I was going to do them on the air, but I think those of you that are serious about it can get one issue that's on the stand now 
then they're very uh, willing and anxious. They send you back copies and keep reprinting their back copies. So if you are an investigator, get them for yourself and put them in your files. And I'll see you next week on Dialogue Conspiracy. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for 10 years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KELRB-FM in Carmel, California.